welcome everybody to Drunk Dudes in a Gun Room. Hey, today we've got an awesome guest. You know, not too often do we get uh, a guest that is still active in the military. I believe he is the second guest that is still in. So without any further ado, let me bring in Bob DePrado. Hey, how's it going, Bob? How you doing? Hey, I, I think you're still muted, brother. Hey, I'm in. There, there you go, right. man. You got to be your own sound guy. <laughs> That's it, man. I, <laughs> I know how that is, man. I'm, I'm the, the video, the sound guy, and everything. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I love what you guys have built here, man. This is a cool show. I've been listening to it the last few weeks. Uh, heard a couple of my friends on here, uh, some great musicians, and I uh, just really, um, you know, want to thank you for what you do. It's pretty cool, man. It's opened my eyes up a lot. I appreciate it, man. I appreciate that. And, and, uh, you know, the, the, the people that are listening, they're going to be in for a special treat because they're going to get to hear some of your music tonight. So, I, and I got some questions on where some of it come from because, because I, I became a fan myself. <laughs> Thanks so, to hear that, Donald. But let's, let's get into, uh, your, your military, man. What, what made you, uh, decide to come in the military? What started that? Um, well, nine 11, really, um, okay. I come from that time period where where I think it influenced all of our lives quite a bit. It was, you know, my generation's kind of, we know where we were in that moment. And no matter where you were at in the country or whatever, it had, it played some sort of significant role, I think, yeah. for all of us. Um, <clears throat> I never dreamed I would have been doing a career in the military. And, uh, you know, I 9-11 happened my senior year in high school. I ended up joining shortly, you know, after high school about a year, a little less than a year after high school, I was 19 and I just wanted to kind of serve in the wars, you know, the wars, which right. uh, I think, I mean, my only experience was as a kid, like you do desert storm or something like that, or, you know, Bosnia, Kosovo, it's kind of over after a while. And I had no idea it was going to go on for two decades. So yeah, I ended up doing 20 years <laughs> and I'll be retiring here um, at the end of this year. In a couple yeah. Months. I, I mean, you know, and I think that's a, that's something a lot of people don't don't realize, you know, is veterans come in, you know, during right there at the, the beginning of 9-11, and they spent their whole military career fighting. I mean, 20 years, came in, retired, and the war went the whole time. You know, I came in in 94, and, uh, you know, like you said, man, the, my first taste of deployments was Bosnia, you know, mm -hmm. and... Uh, that was a whole different, I mean, that was peacekeeping time when I went, I went in 98. So, you know, there was still some things going on, but, uh, technically, you know, it was, it was peacekeeping. So we were more cleaned up than anything. <clears throat> and then, uh, um, things had changed drastically and it became a nine to five, you know, <laughs> banker's job for, for years. And then nine 11 came in and, and it all changed. I, I mean, I still, like you said, it, it changed everybody. I remember what I was doing. I just, PT had just finished. I was in the 160th and we, we had, uh, I did personal hygiene and was getting ready for the, uh, the day, you know, it was, I don't know, it was, I think about 15, 20 minutes till a uh, work call was getting ready to start. And man, it just kind of hit the news. And I was like, what the hell, you know? Mm -hmm. And, yeah. uh, so yeah, I, I get it. And, and, and your career, I mean, so you, you came in and uh, did, did you go um, SF straight um, into to it? Or how long were you in before you went SF? Did you come in with that? that uh... Yeah. So I went, um, I actually tried to, I wanted to be airborne. I wanted to be infantry. I just didn't, you know, how, how many kids really know exactly? I just know I didn't want to be, you know, a cook or something like that. And that's, right. hey, again, not taking anything away from that. I just knew I wanted to kind of try to do something high speed and some adventure and stuff like that. Absolutely. I uh, didn't really know what it all meant, um, but it, there was a ranger contract, and they said you have to wait like a year at the time or something like that. And then mm -hmm. they go, this one's, you know, uh, 18 X-ray Special Forces contract, and, you know, you can still go airborne, infantry, all of that. And you can always, you know, if it doesn't work out, you can go to, you know, try out for rangers or, or whatever. So it just didn't seem like I could really lose in that situation. I wanted yeah. to get going, start training and go. So. I said, well, when do I leave for that? And they said, uh, I think Tuesday. And it was like a Friday <laughs> night. <laughs> so I go, okay, I can wait one year or leave Tuesday. Thanks. Like, you know, they really give you a lot of choices there. <laughs> you know, and and I think, so when I came in, I, I think you had to be an E3 when I when I came in to, to put in a packet to go SF. 
And yeah. I think that was another thing that the war changed because, you know, Afghanistan was was literally a, a special ops war. I mean, that's what it started out as. It, it yeah. wasn't going to be this 20-year infantry, full army. It was a special ops war. And, uh, man, it, it changed the, the, the selection rate, increased. You know, I mean, it was like making the NFL to get selected in, in SF you know, when, when it all first started. And, and I, I'm not saying that it increased drastically. It wasn't like, you know, 80% of people that went in, but, but the numbers did increase of, of how many people went, was selected during selection. And yeah. it was, and just, if they hadn't, honestly, if they hadn't, we wouldn't have had a force left because you're right. You're right. Like you said we were using, you know, small operational teams of 10 to 12 guys, sometimes a little bigger, depending on what, you know, task force and mission was, Mm -hmm. But ultimately, we were using, you know, these force multipliers and stuff to control, you know, large amounts of terrain and stuff, which, you know, I, I kind of argue has never really been the the exact purpose of, of our special operations forces was mm -hmm. the whole terrain like that. Yeah. Uh, also, we'll clearly do, you know, anything we got, we have to do. I mean, you know, you're talking about some of the nation's, you know, best fighting men and women out there. They're going to do it and do a good job at it. Yeah. But uh, we couldn't have sustained what we were doing over there. Um, Iraq, Syria, Afghanistan, Yemen, Philippines, uh, South America. I mean, you name it. Yeah. Couldn't have sustained doing that if we didn't start letting some younger guys in. And, um, you know, I was just one of those guys, you know. Yeah. Um, no, I, I agree. You know, lucky, it, lucky to be a part of it. I, I, man, I, I always say I don't have a single regret in life. <laughs> no, no I, I agree, man. You know, you know, I got I got to see both sides of it. I started out regular army and then I did 10 years in, in the 160th and then I went you know, and finished my career in, in the regular army. And, and those 10 years was, that was by far the best part of my career. You know, the, yeah. the camaraderie, the guys that you meet, the people you work with, and it's a different caliber of, of people. You know, I don't care what rank you are. Everybody just pulls up their sleeves. They get the mission done and it doesn't matter what it is. And uh, that's what, what was so amazing to me when I got there. And you never seen issues with drugs and and people out there doing stupid things until like the war had continued on and and yeah. just like you said it, it had gotten to the point where where they had to do something to increase that force and it, it the same thing affected the 160th it went from a, a volunteer to they they had to become DA select because they couldn't get enough people to come in to be crew chiefs to open up that battalion out there in Washington. So mm -hmm. it became yep. DA select. And that's work when with them, work with them boys quite a bit out here too. Cause I did a lot of years here at first group in Washington. Yeah. So. yeah. so, I mean, that's when drugs started hitting the, the unit and, and just stupid, you know, regular army problems that, that you start seeing because the, the caliber of, of soldier, you know, and I, and I'm not like you, I'm not talking bad about anybody, but yeah, you, you do get that in, in the big force, you know? Yeah. And I, I think there was probably, I, I agree with you, but I also think there's, you know, it's, it's more than just one thing. It's also some of these, these guys and gals, you know, did 10, 12 deployments back to back to back, yeah. you know, maybe two or three divorces, maybe yeah, personal life's in shambles because of them. And, you know, there's just doing this over and over and over again. And it's a kind of high stress, you know, sort of thing. And you're trying to keep your, your yeah. by that point, you're in leadership positions. You're trying to bring everybody home alive and still achieve success. I just think that that stress can add up and, yeah, we like to think that special forces and, you know, our special mm -hmm. aviators and Navy SEALs and everything like that, like they, you know, we put them on a pedestal, but Hey, everyone's got a tolerance. Yep. And, you know, if you did 20 years, Hey, some guys say 20 years, nothing. I know guys have, you know, have been doing 35 straight, you know, and I don't know how yep. they're, I don't know how they do that or why they do that. And yeah. at the same time, I don't look down on somebody that said, Hey man, I did 10 and I was done because that's what I could handle. And yeah. No, I, I, I agree pretty well. And I, these last two have been like, all right, I have got to, you know, get out and, and do something a little different. It's time. It's just time for me. And you know, when it's time, right? So, yep. No, I, yeah, that's what I, when I got to 20, man, I don't know how I made it because at 15, <laughs> I was like, you know, by the time I got to 15, I was like, I wish a fucking deer would just run out in front of me. So I had a reason not to go to work. You know, <laughs> I mean, it was, yeah, man. It was getting to that point. And, I was the I same just, way in school, man. My, my senior year, I was just, I had a hard time. I, I had the smarts and everything. I knew how to do it, but I was having a hard time just making it to class every day and, and yeah. Yeah. not getting distracted. And I just felt like when I hit about, you know, 18 and a half, 19 here in active duty, I almost felt the same way. It's like, 
you know, I got to keep it, you know, I got to keep my zero here because I don't have very long to go, but man, it's hard. You know? <laughs> Some yeah. days just didn't want to even go in. You know, um, and, and I think, you know, we was talking about deployments. I think, you know, you see it on, on both sides of that too. So when I got to the other side, when I, when I went back to the, the regular army, everybody was like, Oh, you know, you, you complain about deployments, but you were only deployed for three months or four months at a time. And then you got to go back. And, and I, and I laugh because they don't know what it's really like. Like you just said, you know, we were in five different theaters. So yes, I went to Afghanistan for three months and then I went back to the States and I still wasn't with my family for three months. I was then supporting the one, the 75th there in Savannah or, or whatever training missions was going on. But then three months later I went to Iraq or I went to yeah. South America or I went wherever, you know, yeah. and we didn't get dwell time. You didn't get that longevity. So there was no dwell time, you know? And, and so, I mean, I did 68 months total in the, in the 20 years that, that I was gone. (laughs) And you look at the, I see the other side of it too, where these guys at at the Fort Stewart train where, where they were gone for nine months to a year, come home and they got three months with their families. And then they were training for another nine month deployment and deployed again. So I don't care what side of the fence you were on. You didn't get a break, you know? Yeah. I mean, yeah. Hell, I've talked to reserve, you know, so does oh, yeah. that did like 18 straight months there or something. I go like, yeah. oh, how? you know, and it isn't about comparing jobs. I mean, 18 no. months, I tell you six months over there is a hard, you know, it is be yeah. really hard. Let's be honest, you know, especially depending on where you were at. If, you know, we, we put in some of them fire bases in those rural, you know, areas in, in Afghanistan at a certain point, as you know, like 10, 12 years ago, we just started putting up these, you know, fire bases out in the middle of nowhere that we really couldn't with, you know, sustain. Yeah. And you're basically down on a bowl surrounded by high ground, just taking indirect fire and sniper fire, machine gun fire every day. Like, I don't care what it yep. says on your chest or your collar or your, your shoulder there. You, you're putting in some work, man. And it's yeah. very stressful. Yeah, no, absolutely, man. Absolutely. And that's, you know, that's the, the, the part that people that never deployed, they, they don't understand, you know, when, when, when the the civilian comes home and he says, man, I had a hell of a day, you know, the boss is on my ass. The hard day that you're talking about, the, the putting in where you're talking about wasn't about the physical hard work. No, you're talking about the, I am trying to stay alive, hard work. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what you're talking about. You're talking about I'm fighting to stay alive because of the the area, the fire base that I'm being put in. Because, like you said, it's it's not sustainable. There's there's documentaries out there of of some of these areas that they should have never been put there. The Strepo, right? Like that comes to mind. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. Just it's easy to armchair quarterback, but you look in hindsight, you go strategically. Like, what do we get out of that? Yeah. Let's say you win every gunfight every single day up in that valley. Yeah. Corongal Valley. What do you get from that? Yeah, there's no, there's no, you know, there's no main uh, critical infrastructure there that we're defending. Yeah, it's like, well, if we're not there, then the Taliban will just be like, they're there anyway. You know, so I again, I, I'm not even judging. I just simply say it was a tough job. You know, we tried, just yeah, running the ring road and securing the ring road. We tried doing like village stability ops, where we literally just moved in with the villagers. We tried, you know, building up all these commando battalions all over the country and just playing whack-a-mole and i've seen everything from dropping bombs everywhere to hey we're not dropping bombs anymore and you know it was a 20-year war so we fought it 20 different ways pretty much yeah and uh none of it that i can recall at least you know from afghanistan that i can remember an easy time you know i did three over there and none of those were easy i've three different strategies but definitely still you know three different times of, of going to warfare and coming back uh, yeah no yeah i i agree man and those boys uh, know how to fight on their own terrain out there too yeah. you know, for what it's worth i think we we misunderstand we see some you know guys in man jammies running around with a machine gun They're like let's give credit where it's due these people have been fighting over there for a long time and i learned a lot of things from them yeah you know uh, yeah. i was on the receiving end of a few tactics where i went oh shit okay yeah that's how you use this terrain and that's how you use medium machine guns to really you know get that fire superiority in this valley you know, they were good at doing that with the very, you know, very basics. They could do yeah. it in sandals with a PKM and one bandolier of ammo, like, and we're dropping, you know, a quarter million dollar bombs and we can't seem to hold that terrain. You know, it's just. Yeah, no, absolutely, you know, man. You know, and, and, 
and I've always said, you know, the village elders are like fucking mountain goats. You know, they <laughs> they they will climb those fucking mountains faster than a twenty-one oh year old man. You yep. know, they, yeah. they it it does not bother them. So yeah, no. seventy-year-old man flip flops run straight up one yeah. of those holes at you know six thousand five hundred feet, and yep, you no. Know, even when the rest of us young young studs, you know, green berets and seals and stuff, were kind of winded, you know, like man, yeah. you know, hey, our abs look good and stuff, but we don't know if we we're ready for this altitude. <laughs> no, you're right, and and like you said, there's there's a reason why they they kicked the Brits' asses twice and the Russians' ass and and yeah. and everything else, you know. So yeah, they they like they've been fighting their ass off. So you know, my my hats off, man. You 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 uh you stayed in a, in a uh, in a hard unit for 20 years, you know, and, and you, you can't do it without love. So, you know, you have to love what you're doing to, to do it. Cause yeah. I, I, I do understand, man, it, it wears on you. You know, when, when I went to the one sixties, I got there in 2000 and uh, it was, it was without a doubt, you know, a good life because nothing was going on, you know, train, train, train and, and uh, have a good time, you know, and, uh, yeah. enjoy that unlimited budget i mean we could pick any school and everything but there was no fighting going on and uh like you said man after 9 11 changed you know we started putting in the work and, and earning the dollars so no i i get it you you yeah. you did it longer than me i got out in 14 is, is when i retired i'd had enough it's a long time you know? yeah you know some and, people I, you're not the first person i've talked to that said 14 plus I talked to a guy who was 16 that's getting out. I know another guy just talking to him, 17 and a half. He goes, dude, I don't know if I'll make it two and a half more years. I'm just trying to get mid-boarded. I go, that's crazy. You can't. But, you know, I just I guess when your pain tolerance is just done for it, you yeah. know, yeah. Um, there's not much you can do. You know, two and a half years don't sound like much after 17. But if you're not happy and you need the help that, you know, you need certain, you know, mental health care or regular health care, whatever yeah. it is. Because let's face it, that's another thing. I think we were all playing – hurt for a lot of years oh yeah and it's yeah. like man if you're not bleeding i mean you know we we had buddies that with their legs blown off and i knew one that you know kept being a team star in special forces with with a with a fake leg i mean this guy could out pt most of the guys with two legs he was a beast so yeah you know you see that and you go well i can't complain about these little joint problems and this back problem i got and the fact that you know yeah maybe i've maybe i've been drinking too damn much or <laughs> maybe you know i've just been depressed or whatever and you put well, that off for a couple decades or, or you know 15 yeah. years whatever it can hit you all at once so. yeah you know i mean i i had a buddy that was in the um 75th there in savannah and and uh we was taking uh, college classes um during uh lunchtime and, and this was before uh 9 11 and then after 9 11 um he got hit with a grenade and uh it fucked him up um lost an eye and and did a lot of damage to him he couldn't be in the military no more but he wanted to come back he didn't want to leave the rangers he was a ranger true and true and yeah. uh you know my, my hat's off to the the rangers association they uh they put him back through college got him another degree and um they created a job uh, a gs position for him and and he got to stay in the battalion as a civilian so you know i i do get it man you know in 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 use of sock when you get there, there's, there's love for, for what you're doing. You know, that, yeah. that, those are the ones that stay because I, I stayed for 10 years. And, and the only reason why I left was because it became DA select and, and they got to see who we were over strength and they got to take people away because of that. And I'd been there mm -hmm. for 10 years, so I had to go, but I would have gave up rank. I would have, I would have went from E6 down to E5 to stay. You know, just because oh, I, yeah. I love it, yeah. you know. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, There's quite a few of us that end up being a little bit of a victim to our own career success there because, you know, yeah. as you go up in, you know, the special forces or, or really just the soft kind of, you know, component there, at some point you're getting in a leadership position. We all want a leadership position, but then yeah. at some point, all right, well, you're, you're, you're pretty much working on a staff or, or something. I mean, yeah, it's a leadership yeah. position, but it ain't like the, like I was the operations officer, you know. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't doing operations. Let's put it that way. As you know, like, you know, yeah. like the three shops doing up there, man. So, yeah, I was – it wasn't a good adjustment for me. And I know that, you know, I'm not the only one <laughs> that got <laughs> away from the team for a year or two. and went like, man, I don't think I actually like 
doing this. Maybe I, don't, <laughs> maybe I actually don't like the Army that much. I just like being on a team, I think, for all these years. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, and, um, and, and I think that's, you know, that's what decided me to retire was when I went back to the regular Army. You know, I was like, yeah, this, this, this sucks, you know, because, yeah. you know, when I first got, when I first got to the regular army, you know, people were like, hey, Sergeant, and, and I was like, hey, my name's Don, and then I learned real quick, uh, no, that shit don't work on that <laughs> side of the world, you know, and I just, I, I, I had a hard time back adjusting to the, the regular army mindset games, you know, and, and, but you had to, because it was just a different mentality of soldiers, yeah. you know, and, and I don't know how to explain it. And I, and I honestly don't know why, but it, it just, it, it was, you know, and, and the babysitting and everything, for everything, you know, you got yeah. a lot of young soldiers that need to yeah. be looked after. Yeah. And, you know, you got, you're going to have to have a different culture when you're doing that. Yeah. And everybody asked me when I retired, what I was going to do. And I said, well, I guess I'm going to open up a daycare. Cause that seems to be the only thing I'm fucking qualified <laughs> to do. I said, I've been babysitting y'all's asses for the last couple of years. I, I guess that's what I'm going to do. <laughs> you know? Yeah. But yeah, I mean, it, it was, man, it was just, it was a different world. So where, where did some of your uh, music um, come into? When did, uh, when did you start uh, playing music? Has it always been with you through the military? Were you one of those guys that brought guitars with all the deployments? And I became and that guy. Yeah? yeah. I became that guy. Um, I, I was injured fairly significantly. I mean, Hey, I was walking and talking and everything. So, Hey, I don't, you know, but, you know, I did get a purple heart, took, you know, some shrapnel and took a little blast or whatever. But I needed mm -hmm. a knee surgery, bottom line, when I got back from the deployment. Of course, got to finish the deployment, you know. Yeah. So I get back from that. By the time they go in there to repair my knee, it, it was worse than they thought. You know, I had just all that um, car, all that cartilage and everything was just gone because I had just the whole summer. I just ran around in kit and fast roped and, you know, all the stuff that yeah. we used to do with you guys out there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> on a bad knee. So it started as a torn meniscus. It got worse and worse. So they basically had to like remove that meniscus and do a bunch of other work. And, you know, I was kind of on the couch for a few weeks and man, I realized real quickly that wasn't working, you know, like you take a guy straight out of that action flow environment. I come back, get a, you know, knee surgery and I'm just laying there on the couch, yeah. with pain pills, beer, whatever I need, but Hey, that's all there is to do all day. So Long story short, I guess, if that's not too late for that, I went and got a cheap guitar and I sat there on that couch just, you know, making noises just like anyone does when they first start. But that was right. 2007. So I think I was 23, 24. Um, I wouldn't say I was any good at it for a while. I'd just kind of do that. And then, um, you know, I, I think every time I kind of hit some tough times, you know, music was one of the, all these, the things that I kind of relied upon. Yeah be it my first divorce, be it the first time I've had to deal with PTSD, be it, you know, when you lose all your family members and folks back here, cause you've been so busy over there and you're like, man, geez, my grandma, you know, helped raise me. And you know, I didn't even have a relationship with her for the last 10 years, you know, and she's gone now. Just little things like that. Whenever yeah. things like that popped up, you know, that guitar was always by my side. And um, I just think writing a song probably came naturally eventually, you know, a couple of years yeah. ago, I, I, I wrote a song. Seeing <laughs> uh, Red was the first one. And mm -hmm. I think I sent you that one was the first one. Yeah. Where I, I go, hey, I think I wrote a whole song here. Wow. I didn't even know I, I could do something like that. You know? And then, um, I don't know. It just kind of took off, man. It became, you know, my my personal way of journaling and, and sometimes the way I do therapy and, and, you know, sometimes how I even try to help others. Uh with some of their problems. I think music is a very powerful tool in that regard. Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I agree because I, I was never a musical person, you know? Um, I, I, I took band when I was in uh, middle school and I would, I didn't like it. I didn't enjoy it. And uh, I got kicked out of band um, when I was in eighth grade because I got caught making out in the soundproof booth. So you're supposed it, to, be, right? Yeah, that's what I thought. You know, the, the negative to that for anybody out there is it's soundproof. So you not only can they not hear you, but you can't hear the teachers coming. So, <laughs> <laughs> it works both ways. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, but because she was always first chair and I was always shitty, um, it was obviously my fault and I instigated it. So I got kicked out. So, <laughs> but uh, um, until I started this radio station, man, 
and uh you know put after military life and everything i didn't realize until started talking to these artists how much music has really helped a lot of people and now that i've started listening to some of these songs and and i'm more involved in in scheduling and and listening to songs more in depth now i'm starting to relate to a lot of these songs and uh I, so i completely get it i do i you know i may not be able to play but now they're they're resonating and 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 it's some of the stuff you know um i can relate to because especially because a lot of them are veterans so some of the stuff they're singing about i can relate to because i've either kind of done it or i've heard stories about it or 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 something to to those you know yeah. minds so yeah i i do get it man you know. and that's a hard, uh, you know, it's a line, hard line I walk to because it's it'd be really easy for me to write just nothing but veteran songs and going yeah. overseas and all that. But, you know, it wouldn't probably feel genuine and it wouldn't probably, um, I don't know, I just think there's a lot of us that we wouldn't want to do that. But every once in a while, we just can't help it that our experiences are going to kind of come together in a song. Like if you're a songwriter, your experiences yeah. are going to influence that writing. And if you did, you know, 15, 20 years in this thing, it's going to come, you know, it's going to yep. hear its head in there a little bit. So I never really set out to write songs for veterans or something like that, or to yeah. write, get that attention as, a, oh, I'm, this is the guy that writes the war songs or anything. But, um, you know, just in the process, yeah, it seems like a couple of my better ones so far have just happened to involve, you know, certain pieces of my military career or experience. Well, I, I think, uh, so, I mean, one thing about that is, is the military is a giant melting pot, man. So you get people from all walks of life. So just because it related to a veteran, a lot of people assume that it related to them because of their military career. But mm -hmm. a lot of people have, uh, have different things that, that they relate to just from their, their previous lives. They're, they're pre-military, you know? And, and that's one thing that I always push, you know, I started this radio station because I want, I want to see veterans not lose their time. And that's what I kind of feel like when I started interviewing these, these veterans, you know, the one thing I started noticing was, man, how far behind the power curve, you know, a lot of them are in their, in their music careers. You know, they, they dedicated 10 years, five years, 20 years oh, yeah. to, to the, to the military. And, and you, you can't pursue a, a full-time music career while you're in. Well, your counterparts that you're now competing against are half your age and have been doing it twice as long, you know? And, and I, I didn't like, you know, when I was podcasting, it's hard to get your word out just because of algorithms. You're competing against everybody. And we're such a small community. And so that's why I came up with this idea for the radio station. But the one thing I didn't want, I, I wanted a radio station for veterans, but I don't want people to get noticed because they're veterans. I want people to, to notice them because of their talent. And that's what I want. I don't want, I don't want anybody to say, well, you know, so-and-so made it because they, they served. And that's the only reason why I, I <laughs> firmly believe that the talent pool that, that is on that radio station is should be on every radio station. And the only reason why it's not is because everybody is now competing on the internet and it's so hard to find people. I mean, you think, you know, you could have a career as a guy that sits there and does nothing but listening to YouTube videos and he could listen to videos every day for eight hours a day for his whole career and not hear everybody that's on there. There's this, that many people, you know? So it's about just having a place for everybody to get their, their voices heard. And I wanted a place to where you guys, there was no algorithms drowning you guys out. There was no competition. You know, everybody got their time to shine and, and their time to play. And, and that's what it was about. But I always try to push, you know, yes, we're veteran um, related, but it's not about just being a veteran. It's you guys are on here because you're pursuing a right. career. Hopefully it's you good. Know? Right. <laughs> yeah. And that, and that's what it's about. You know, if the music's not good, then I don't think anyone's going to listen to bad music just because of what you did as a job or whatever, you right. know? Um, yeah. And, and, and I want, <clears throat> I want people that are, are serious about trying to do a career, you know, everybody that, that is doing it, you know, they, they have the skills and the, and the set and, and that's what their, their mindset is, is, is it's in their back, their mind that, you know, they want to be 
musicians or they want to be performing you know it's not that they're just uh, uh, a hobbyist you know and, right. and that's what that's what it's it's all about um and and you was talking about not everything's uh military related you got a song out there that uh let me pull it up here uh it is called tennessee mystery that's yeah. uh, that's not necessarily military related is it not at all <laughs> I, I i i love that that song i i had to smile when i heard it because it because it, it, it's kind of funny, man, but it, it's a good song. Where, where did where did that song come from? Oh, man, I, <laughs> I have it. it believe, well, a good friend of mine I was in the military with was from, you know, the hills of Tennessee. And he would always talk about bluegrass and some of those old legends and, you know, some of the earlier that bluegrass influenced country as well. But it's really like bluegrass, I think, mainly up in that area. And uh, it was just this whole new kind of genre to me that I, I started to take a liking to. And uh, just the process of, you know, learning about some of these names and some of the, you know, um, the mystery that is those hills that produces so many great musicians. It really yeah. does. You know, you look back and go, geez, all of them, you know. Yeah, no, you're right. Um, and I, I don't know. And so I just started writing this song. I literally have just some of them, you know, a chorus or you're something and. This particular one, I was just playing a couple of chords. I just go, look out, nobody's seen Johnny since that <laughs> day. Where'd it go? Oh, man, that sounds cool. Yeah. And I just started writing it. So the first line of the first verse is where it started, and I just wrote it from start to, to finish, which is, if anyone ever asked me, like, how to write songs, I had no clue, because sometimes a hook comes, and then you build everything around that, and then sometimes you're like, man... I think I got this great verse or, or chorus, but no, it's actually a bridge into another song. And that particular song, I just sat down and wrote that whole thing in probably, you know, 30, 40 minutes. Wow. Yeah, it's it's good, man. Uh, Dude, I, and just it kind of came to me. I guess my antenna was just up. I don't even know if <laughs> it's weird when one just comes to you like that. You yeah. go, Dude, I don't know. But I, it was just supposed to be fun, really. And it's it's gotten a pretty good reaction to most of the, the folks that have... Uh, Listen, unless, unless they're lying to me. <laughs> no, no, I, I I liked it too, man. When because when I was listening to each of your songs, that was one of them that that stuck out to my mind. And you know, the other thing too that kind of blew me away was was when I was listening to this, I was like, man, you know, I I seen your name with Operation Encore, but you know, I I really didn't see. It was like I didn't know if like you were going to be like a new artist or or if you've done any if you had already done your recordings. I wasn't sure where the tie was, what was, was with you and them. And then I was listening to your music and I was like, man, this guy's good. I mean, he is really good. And then he was like, yeah, I recorded these in my buddy's garage. I was like, are you <laughs> kidding me? <laughs> I said, dude, you need to pursue this as a, as a yeah. full-time job, man. Cause well, I, I really are good. That, Don. I plan on doing it as well, man. You know, literally we just got our, uh, household goods or at least our unaccompanied baggage mm -hmm. for my last PCS, you know, yesterday and we're getting our household goods. So we're still in the middle of a PCS here. I haven't even yeah. had my guitars on me. Yeah. I got an opportunity to go down there in Florida and play a pretty big show. And I had to borrow my buddy's kid's guitar <laughs> that he's been learning on. <laughs> it's a guitar is a guitar. I threw some new strings on it and went up there and played the whole show with a guitar I never played with before. So that is awesome, uh, man. So yeah, I'm not going to let the music, you know, stop just because of uh, what's going on. I'm going through a lot of PCS and as far as, you know, med board and, and yeah. transition and everything. But, uh, you know, this music stuff ain't going nowhere. I'm going to keep on writing, keep putting them out and keep trying to get out there in front of, you know, an audience and, and grow that audience because I know I have something to offer. Yeah, you do. You do, dude. So I'm going to, I'm going to, if you don't mind, man, I'm going to go ahead and throw one of your songs up and let uh, everybody hear this because, uh, Man, I'm gonna tell you, I I love, I love your music, and this is one this is one of the songs. You know, th this is the benefit of being the uh, host. You get to pick whatever you want to hear. So, yeah. this is one of them that I like, man. Okay. Both ends my time, it flies by. 
like a crow Learning that your friends ain't like mine But why? Nobody knows You can take a man out of the fight Yeah, take the fight out of that man You can promise him a brand new life As you take him right out of that sand Yeah, I'm in my wits end of my life But I know what I chose The times are just getting and I drive All night with no place to go You can be man now hold up the fight Yeah, take the fight out of that man You can storm in the middle of the night As you take his guns right out of his hand Between a rock and a hard place we fight We defy that we're six feet below Watching with heartbreak, we might rewrite stories that were told. They say the war is over. Since when? Must be nice for them. Must be nice. What about the soldiers? Got a GI Bill, a handful of pills, and they fight that war with me. I want some of pills. You can take a man out of the fire. Yeah, take the fire out of that man. You can take a man out of the fire. Yeah, take the fire out of that man. Gotta keep on fighting. You can take a man out of the fire. Yeah, take the fire out of that man. War goes on forever. You always have a friend to call. Brothers, you're not alone. Man, I'm going to tell you. When I heard that song, I was like, is this dude following me? I mean, was he like standing behind me writing this song? Because I'm going to tell you, man, that if if you look up that song in the dictionary it says soldier because that is that is the soldier that enlisted after 911 till today because that's what they're going through i mean that is it you know i i don't know how else to explain it because everything that you put in there has touched on what people are going through right now yeah you know i mean that was there's a lot of songs out there that are about uh about soldiers but man you really you really hit it and and the way you put that song together bro that is amazing it really is i really appreciate it i had some help on that one i sent my buddy's garage you know my buddy's john mccoy out there and shout out to him he's 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 a He's going to be a producer or something someday. He's just too good. He can play music. He can write music. He can sing. But 
right? His real talent is, is I think that, and he had a lot to do with, with some of that, just the vibe in it. Mm-hmm. You know, I was playing that thing on acoustic kind of slow, to be honest. It was, yeah. you know, you can take a game, man. And he kind of, you know, made, he kind of, we kind of sped it up a little bit, made it jump a little more and kind of yeah. made it almost, you know, a little more fun. And then it gets down and it gets kind of almost, you know, real slow and, and, um, kind of dramatic for that yeah. bridge part where it's the, the war is over and all. you know that yeah. was all on, on, on purpose um, yeah dude and it made it kind of interesting and cool and if you hear the female doing backup vocals she was a, a navy singer as well um that he was working with at the time and she liked the song and did backup vocals and i'm, I'm sorry i don't remember your name hun if you're out there but she did a wonderful job on it and um yeah. i go Phew. He goes, what do you think? You like it? When I heard it, I go, well, you can turn mine down and hers up. Yeah. Great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. I'm going to tell you, dude, there's, I, you know, I don't know how many people, you know, are, are voting on our top 20 right now as far as based off of, uh, you know, the, the artists that are just sharing, if they're just voting for the pages that they're following. But if people are listening to the music, there's no way that song will not make it in the top 20. Dude, that that song is awesome. And like I said, when I, the part that that resonates to me is is just like when you you said, man. When I got out, I was like, dude, if I ever see fucking sand again, it'll be too soon. <laughs> you know, and and to this day I still don't enjoy going to the beaches and and shit like that. But I miss being over there. I do. I, and, and I, and every soldier I've talked to, everybody that I've interviewed, you know, they all say the same thing. You know, it's simple. You know, you, you get up, you stay alive, wash, rinse, repeat, you know, and you don't have to deal with the the bullshit and the drama that goes on in the States. It, It is much harder to function here than it is over there. And, and I do, I do, you know, I would go back in a heartbeat. I would. Yeah, absolutely. And we all know it's just, it's been said a million times, so this is not going to be profound. But it was, it was we did it for the people to our left and right over there. Yeah, I don't know many. I mean, sure, the country, yeah, but I mean, when you're when you're actually down there deployed and the bullets are flying, what are you really thinking of? You're thinking about the people you're left and right that you're maneuvering yeah. with or helping to seek cover with or, or helping maybe to uh, you know you know do some some tactical, you know, medical care yep. and all those things, you, you realize how, how important those people, you know, became your, your family, right. That became yep. my tribe, my family, my purpose, my everything. And, um, I realized that it's not entirely gone. What happened to a lot of us is we all got out and ran back to some place that we're either from or, or, or maybe not yeah. and kind of hid out from each other, a lot of us. And that's why what you're doing here is special. And that's why I'm, you know, I'm going to keep trying to make music that veterans appreciate and keep that going. You know, I yep. want everyone to listen to it. But if, if what you're saying is right and you're not the first veteran to say that song kind of meant something to me, then, you know, that's important enough for yeah. me. Um, I love that aspect of it. You know, talking almost veteran outreach type of stuff. Yeah, and, man. Um, folks need to know they are not alone out there. Um, you know. I've gone yeah. through stuff and I probably, I still do, to be honest. So, Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, man. Just worrying over. That's the bottom line. We'd, well, you'd all go back in a second and do it all again. Yep. And yet, you know, the thing that might've hurt us a little bit is, is also the thing that we kind of seem to cherish and, you know, put on that pedestal. It's a, it's a, it's a strange one, right? It's just a strange dynamic. I think it's because it's so simple over there. It's what makes sense. I mean, there's no, you know, it's 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 no gray you know you're the enemy i'm not and you live fight and watch out for left and right you know you come back here you don't know if the person you're really talking to is looking out for you or not i mean right things you know and you can't deal with problems here like you would over there right (laughs) you know and and that's where everything gets confusing for, for veterans, you know, you, and, and I'm not saying that's normal. That's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying it should be like that. What I'm saying is you can't put people for these long periods, like we were talking about for, for these many years and, and say the cage is open, go take care of business and then 
come home and say, no, 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 you, you got to be polite. You got to be nice. You can't, you can't talk to people like that. No, right. no, why did you hit that guy at the bar? You can't do that. You know, it, you, you just can't yeah. have it both ways. Not when it's, you know, if it was like you deployed one time, okay, I get that, you know, but you guys seen how the war went, it transitioned, you know, it went from, from just the convoys, the convoys was, if you got in between me and the guy in front of you, I was taking the gun and shooting everybody inside the truck, the vehicle, you know, and then it was like, oh, we don't want to do that again, you know, so now we're going to ram them off the road. Well, then those cars were blowing up because they were putting IDs in them. So, I mean, we kept adjusting and adjusting. And then it finally got to the point where we weren't even kicking in doors no more. We were knocking on the doors and playing the game of hide and seek. Okay, you guys hide all your stuff. We'll give you time and then we'll come in and find them. It's, you know, Easter egg hunting time. And so, I mean, we, we were there for so long. We seen that transition, you know, and, and like I said, I spent 20% of my military career. I did 20 years, 68 months was deployed, you know, nine, nine months of that was Bosnia. So, okay, we won't count that. So 60 months of it was, was, uh, Iraq and Afghanistan, you know, so five years out of the 20 was spent in that kind of environment, you know? But then you want me to to come back home and and not have anger issues. I'm supposed right. to just be nice, yeah. <laughs> you know. And you it's don't like get we all a... agree too. We're like we should all be nice, but right. But it, you just it just doesn't I, work. It, you just there's yeah. not there's not a switch. You just can't turn it off. Yeah, you and know? you're right. I, I, I unfortunately it seems to manifest in mo- uh, most of us that I've seen in in, in anger. Yeah. Um, I, that's what I see more often with the PTSD, especially when mixed with a little bit of alcohol, is I see people getting angry and intolerant and impatient with yeah. everything, including their own emotions and their own feelings. Yeah, um, it, that's what happened with me. That's when, a when I, mechanism, I suppose, but I have the same thing. Yeah, It's easier for me to get angry than it is to actually feel some of these things and, and you know, truly process them. Yeah. You know, when, when I when I got out, dude, I think I did the worst thing. You know, I... I I couldn't find a job, so I decided to open up a trucking company. And, and I got in a truck, and I drove 650 miles a day in a, in a little sleeper. And I stayed alone for six weeks at a time and was isolated. And, you know, and I didn't realize to what extent that, you know, my anger was getting to. Until one day, literally, I had been sitting at a fuel pump for 20 fucking minutes. And I couldn't move because there was a truck behind me. There was a truck in front of me. And the guy in front of me was sitting there fucking eating. And it just pissed me off to the point where I ran up and yanked up his fucking door and threatened to pull him out of his fucking truck if he didn't move, you know, not even thinking. I just seen fucking red and I was tired of it and I was on a schedule trying to go, you know, and uh, it's just like you said, man, it's just fucking anger over things that I I shouldn't even been fucking mad about. Yeah. You know, and and it just or maybe you had a slight cause for being upset. But you, you over not to that not extent. You, I mean, any of us, right? Like yeah. that's me too. Like, yeah, no, wait a minute. I had a slight reason to be upset when that that car cut me off. I had a slight reason to, but you know, not to the extent where I should be chasing them down or threatening their lives or yeah. whatever. And I'm not saying that happened. It's just an example. Right. But, um, <laughs> we all know. I, I can relate to what you're saying. The guy's just yeah. sitting there eating. I mean, yeah. you're taking that as a personal affront because you're like, dude, you, you realize you're wasting my time now. Yeah. And that's something for sure in the military, on the teams, even if it was us working with 160th there, we'd have been like, hey, crew chief, whatever, let's go, dude. You know what I mean? Yeah, all of us waiting. Now you're going to eat. Let's go. We got to fuel up and get out of here, right? Yep. Yeah, I mean, especially, you know, I I own the truck, so all the bills, you know, I'm I'm burning my hours. And, I, you know, my truck payment's $642 damn dollars a week. I ain't got time for you to eat your fucking cheeseburger. (laughs) Right. (laughs) You know? Eat it on the go like the rest of us did. <laughs> you know, especially when you can go park, park in the fucking parking lot. Do whatever you want to do. <laughs> right. But yeah, man, you know, and, and and until I got help, you know, um, and and it really, to be honest, until I started podcasting, you know, I mean, I got some I got some help and and I was better. You know, my wife would tell you I was nicer. You know, I wasn't I wasn't. I, I'm better now than I was even after that, you know, and uh a lot of people complain about the VA, but I've been lucky, you know, with the, the therapist that I've had um, now. So, I mean, you know, my hat's off to, uh, to uh, 
the St. James VA because they've done great for me. And, uh, right. you know, so, uh, you know, and I tell her all the time, you know, this is the, the most clear that I've, I, I wish I was thinking this clear when I own my business, I probably mm-hmm. still own my business, <laughs> but, mm-hmm. uh, but, uh, um, you That's know, the important thing, you know, here at this, I'm going through transition as well. I'm going through all these resources and we, we, we understand it's actually great. I'll, I'll, be, I'll go out there out of my way to say, I am surprised at how many resources there are. There's almost more than you can use and they yeah. are all helpful. Um, but it's very much still driven towards like, Hey, let's find that box to put you in. You want to be yeah. a truck driver, drive a truck. You want to do this? Do that's yeah. not a problem. I mean, most of these folks need to get out in the next week. They need a paycheck to take care of their families. But I don't know if all of us are in the right state of mind when we do 2024, whatever, and then we go through this six month transition or, or eight month, whatever. And then we're on the other side, we're driving a truck and we're doing something else entirely. And we haven't fully processed what just happened over the last 25 years of our life. Yeah. And um, I think it's fair to say that a lot of folks get out, pursue that first thing and it, it doesn't necessarily always work out they because they still weren't quite right you know up here yeah no i you know, i just I weren't a good place agree. i guess is the best way to say it you know yeah the you know the the transitioning part of uh of the army you know and and i can't speak for any of the, the services but for the army needs a lot of work um they they have came up with like you said with a lot of great programs uh, i kind of related to the the jack of all trades, the master of none, because <laughs> they have, they, they brought in a lot of people, but it is hit or miss. You can, you can go one day to one guy's class and he is passionate about it and he gives you great information and great advice and, and he'll do everything for you. But you go to the next guy's class about a different topic and that person is just collecting a fucking check, yeah. you know, and, and it is, it really is. It's just hit or miss on, on how good that transition is and and how much emphasis that base is putting in on it. And none of it is based off of your mental health. It is about giving you the information and the swift boot in the ass. And, and when you walk away that last time, as you're flipping off the gate, as you're going out to your org, you're saying, ah, I'm a free guy. (laughs) Well, they're flipping you off too, because you're forgot about. And, You know, and that's why transitioning from the military is the hardest part. It's not a coincidence that the most dangerous time for veteran suicide comes in those first couple of years after transitioning out of the military, yeah. you know, because that's when the rude awakening really hits. You know, everything, you know, changes. And, and that's when it's tough. man. It really is. And, and just like you said, everything you just mentioned, a lot of the, the listeners that aren't in the military, they probably didn't understand what you was talking about with you know, your, your household goods and, and all your transitioning, but, you know, I could relate to what you and your family are going through right now. Your house is in a wreck, you know, you're, you're moving in locations. You're like, fuck, where's the skillet? I just order a damn pizza. Do we got the money for the pizza? You know? (laughs) Yeah. We were, yeah, we were just sitting there talking about it. My wife and I was like, man, we have spent a lot of money. Why we spent so much money. I'm like, well, because it sucks to, you know, cooking a house when you ain't got anything, Yeah. you know, like we, we had to wait two or three months just to get our, you know, basic couple pots and pans and things. So, you know, I don't know when you're eating off of, you know, uh, you know, paper plates and plastic forks, like you tend to just order a pizza or whatever. I mean, yep. I, we're guilty of it as, as anybody. So, <laughs> yep. Yeah, no, I, I, I know. And then like the, that first grocery bill, when you're like, why in the hell is our grocery bill so high? <laughs> oh, it's because you don't have any cleaning supplies and you're buying all your laundry yeah. detergent and all the cleaning supplies. Yeah. Cause you didn't ship any of that, but you threw half of that shit away when you moved, you know? Yeah. yeah. No, I, I get it, man. Exactly. And, Cause you can't take it. But yeah. anyways, so explaining the PCS to everybody is probably not the most fun. But uh, yeah, you you end up throwing everything away and buying new stuff, even yeah. even though you know, there's a great program in place for it. They just, you know, like your cleaning supplies, all that stuff, like you said, you can't bring it. You can't bring yeah. your wine bottles or whatever you're trying to bring. So you end up just throwing all this stuff out and it kills you. But yeah, man, you're you right. Know. You are absolutely right. So uh, let me ask you this, man. Uh did you did did you do anything with Operation Encore? Have were you an artist with them, or have you applied with them? Yeah, yeah. So I applied with them um, nearly two years ago. Got okay. picked up. I was 
there, some of these folks are, you know, per, were fairly established musicians, you know, or they were, mm-hmm. at least had been on the road and had a band and this and that. I was not that. So I just literally sent a video of me being goofy with an acoustic guitar or something. <laughs> and they liked it enough to bring me on, but I wasn't, you know, brought on to be a headliner right away, if that's fair, especially since I was still active duty. I was living yeah. overseas. And so I've done a few th- things with, uh, with Operation Encore. They've been wonderful to me, including, yeah. you know, opening for Brad Paisley recently. Um, you know, it was a fundraiser and all that, but I mean, still, yeah, still, still did it. Still got to take part in it. That. that was a blast. And, um, you know, meeting all the great musicians, uh, almost, I think almost everyone that's been on your podcast so far, I've, I've met and had a personal relationship with um, from Operation Encore. And, um, I just that, that's another cool thing. It's networking, man. Like you said, yeah. it's knowing other veteran musicians that are all over the country doing the, Hey, what are you guys doing out there to get so many gigs? Okay. And then, you know, what's going on down here and, you know, or just, Hey, we've written a couple songs together where we'll just kind of say, I like your writing style. You like mine. Okay. We'll, we'll, we'll write one and just whoever ends up singing it better can have it. You know? <laughs> yeah, man. So, so where were, where are you calling home at? Uh, well, I just, uh, PCS to joint base Lewis McCord. It's in Washington, okay. uh, Seattle area. Basically, okay. um, I'm going to be uh, doing my medical board and retiring out of here. And then, you know, I, I don't I don't imagine this will be a permanent uh, stay here. So uh, we'll probably go somewhere where there's, you know, a little more with the music and stuff going on. Um, Texas, Florida, you know, Tennessee. Those are all hot spots for, for that sort of thing. Oh, um, man, you, you come to Missouri, man. Let me know. I, I, that's where I'm at, man. I'll buy you a beer. Hey, all right. Hey. I can do that. Hopefully, I'm. Hey, hopefully, I'm getting to the point where I'm, you know, visiting everywhere, man. Because you know, just like JB said on your podcast last week or whatever it was, you know, the the mu- the money's in in going around and then selling tickets to a show. I mean, yeah, it is. If you're trying to create tracks and and just sell them on the internet or something, that I, that very seldom's going to work. You got to put yeah. free content out there, build a fan base, and then try to get them to buy tickets to something. So yeah, absolutely, um, man. I'm just very early on in this game. I'm looking forward to doing all of that. Yep. Um, and, and, and giving back into veterans programs and stuff, you know? Well, I'm going to, I'm going to link you up with, uh, hero stock. I'm sure you've heard a lot of, a lot of us talking about that. He's already booking gigs for, uh, next year. Okay. Um, he's, he is trying to put together, um, believe it or not, he's trying to put together a hero stock tour. <laughs> so, nice. you know, yeah. just about everybody that comes on my show, he hits up. So I'm going to definitely link you guys up. <clears throat> and uh, maybe something will work out with uh, a gig for that too, you know? So. Absolutely, man. Anytime I can get up on stage or on a podcast or anywhere else, uh, I'm, I'm always uh, excited to do it, you know, because that's how you get your name out there. It's how you get your, your message out there and ultimately get your, your music and what you're trying to accomplish in this world out there. And I'm trying to help people. So if people don't hear the music or, or, or if I can't be in a position where I, you know, I can and meet some of these folks who need yeah. help, then I'm just kind of wasting my time. So, I love all the opportunities I can get, and I really appreciate it. Absolutely. There's a um, there's another SF guy out there in Seattle. Um, he's a head of an organization called uh, Leaving the Sideline, is what it's called. Yeah. Uh, you know you know about it? I've heard about heard about it recently, and they asked me to send a little demo tape, and I did. Uh, well, then I will put in a word for you because okay. the guy that is in charge of that is actually. Um, one of the warrant officers that was with me when I left the 160th, no he kidding. left the, uh, <laughs> he left the, uh, um, third group. I think it was third group he was in and, uh, became a warrant officer and went to the regular army. He got injured. And, uh, then he, uh, went back to, um, the group as a, a warrant officer and, uh, his, uh, he was on a jump and his shoot didn't open. And, uh, ended up having to get out. He got, he got, uh, he got hurt pretty bad. 17 or 20 surgeries later. He's now, uh, out and about, but he's, he's running. He's the one that runs that program. Uh, his name's, uh, Michael Rathburn, but, uh, awesome, right. awesome dude. Yeah, I heard, I heard it was a warrant officer and everything. I didn't, I didn't know his name and all that, but yep. I heard through another friend of mine that's somehow involved in it, or at least his friends yep. with, with Michael, maybe. Um, so I said, Hey, what, why not? So I sent, yeah. I think I sent the song you just played up there, Fighting Man to him. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I will, uh, as soon as we get off, I will text him because, uh, yeah, he is, uh, he is a one hell of a guy. So, 
yeah, he he uh, he he will talk your ear off, and uh, the stories he will tell you will make you laugh because he, he's done some crazy shit. <laughs> <laughs> I bet. So, but uh, Bob, I, I appreciate you coming on, man. And uh, you know, I, I'm a fan of your music, and and I'm sure everybody else on the radio station is going to be a fan. And uh, I'm sure you say you're at the beginning of your career, but I, I don't think you have a clue how big your career is going to get because I, I think you're going to go places, man. I really do. And I'm not just saying that because you're on the show. I when when I heard that and you you told me you was recording it in the garage, I was like, holy shit. <laughs> so I, I think you're going to be good, man. So Always good to be humble in this, you know, especially before you've made a real name for yourself. Um, but hey, I don't have a problem at all about other people bragging about my music or telling me that it sounds good. So I really, I really appreciate that, Donald, and really appreciate you having me on, brother. Anytime, uh, anything I can I, do for the show or the movement, man, let me know. Well, I, I appreciate that, man. And uh, I will, uh, any links, If uh, do you got any merch store links or anything like that in your? Uh, not yeah. No? Okay. I'm not selling merch and stuff yet. I got to get. Okay. You know, get myself underneath me here. You know, get my feet underneath me and go kind of hit the road. And you know, I'm not. No, even I understand. To, I ain't trying to sell Bob the Prado T-shirts just yet. Hey man, if they <laughs> just listen to the song. Maybe go on there and vote vote for me on the top twenty on this channel. I, I'll be happy with that. There you go, man. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Don't feel bad. I don't have any merch to sell either, man. <laughs> and I've been doing this for two years. I didn't so. even had any forks until like yesterday. So. Hey man, <laughs> I give you the shirt off my back, but I ain't selling nothing right now. <laughs> I'm with you, man. I'm with you. Well, you take care, brother, and and I appreciate you. And uh, you be safe, man. We'll do. You as well, brother. Have All a right, good man. one. Yep, you too. Take care. Yeah.